Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes as always and today I'm joined by two guests, a repeat guest, Dr. Robert McCauley. He is the William Rand Cannon Jr. University Professor of Philosophy at the Center for Mind, Brain and Culture at Emory University and also Dr. George Graham former professor of philosophy at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and Georgia State University, and the A.C. Reed professor of philosophy at Wake Forest University, and they are both authors of a recent book, Hearing Voices and Other Matters of the Mind, What Mental Abnormalities Can Teach Us About Religions. That is going to be the focus of our conversation today. So, Drs. Macaulay and Graham, thank you so much for taking the time to call on the show. Dr. Macaulay, thank you for coming again. And Dr. Graham, it's really nice to meet you. Pleasure is mutual. Okay, great. So um, let's start with some basics. Uh, let's try to follow uh, the steps that you follow on the, in the book uh, and start by covering some basics, perhaps clarify some of the um, terms that you use in the book and also um, perhaps uh, go back to understanding how religion evolved in the first place. So in, in the book you talk about ecumenical naturalism. What is that? It, I, I'll take that, Bob. Is that okay there? Um, Start away. <laughs> it's naturalistic in the sense that it looks at religion without making religious assumptions about the existence of special religious entities. It tries to explain what's happening in human belief formation and religious belief formation in a thoroughly naturalistic and not supernaturalistic way. It's ecumenical because it's going to look at religious cognition in three domains. Ordinary religious cognition, religious cognition that is associated with and sometimes appears in disorders, and religious abnormalities that may or may not be disorders, but yet nonetheless have some departure from the norm. And that's why we use the term ecumenical. It's the play on the word ecumenical, which is quite typically used to talk about an ecumenical approach to diverse religions. But we're talking about an ecumenical approach, not just to diverse religions, but to various forms of religious cognition and under conditions in which their deficits are disorders that may or may not involve religious experiences and, and cognitive activities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, at a certain point there, you mentioned religious cognition. When you mention that, uh, I mean, uh, how should we understand religious cognition? Is it basically what results from a set of cognitive mechanisms that maybe we've evolved, maybe uh, we develop under the influence of uh, religious, uh, re religious culture or something like that, that apply only to religion? How does it work exactly? Well, I guess I would say that uh, uh, you've already, the question already has sort of dived deep into uh, some of our theoretical orientations. I mean, in terms of what might count as religious cognition, it seems to me lots of things can surely count as religious cognition. Uh, we don't pretend to have a comprehensive account of all of religious cognition. Uh, what we're interested in is trying to get a little explanatory leverage. Um, on at least some of it, and, and perhaps some of it that is particularly uh, recurrent across religious systems. Um, I guess I would say, you know, any kind of um, um, aspects of mental life that involve uh, religious materials and contents, um, and in particular, you know, any sorts of uh, cognition that occurs in religious settings. I mean, I think the, if you take the combination of those two things, those two features, that might kind of narrow it down fairly well. 
as at least the least controversial examples. Um, one of the positions that we take in the book, and indeed sort of a, a sub-thesis under the ecumenical naturalist conception, is that um, broadly speaking, we sort of subscribe to uh, the, the enterprise of the cognitive science of religion, uh, and in particular, the byproduct theory. And I take it that's sort of the way you formulated the question was kind of alluding to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, um, you know, our claim and the claim that of the cognitive science of religion is that such representations of, of the sort that I've just described are, you know, actually in many ways quite like ordinary cognition. Um, uh, and that's because they're grounded basically in the same cognitive systems. Uh, what we've called, uh, and I've called in some other works, maturationally natural cognitive systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so there aren't any cognitive uh, mechanisms or systems that we know of that are specific to religion, that only provide a basis or work uh, or, or are applied to religion uh, only? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm uh, at least on record as having said, I don't think there is any sort of department of religion in the brain uh, uh, that uh, religious cognition is of a piece with uh, the wide expanse of, of human cognition. Um, actually, I mean, maybe at this point it is the appropriate time to show that first figure. Uh, if, yeah, uh, sure, go ahead. I mean, this is the first figure in the book. Uh, and behind the categories George was describing, uh, this is an even sort of broader conception of, of uh, continuities. I mean, you know, the notion is, is that, note in the center of the triangle there, it just says there's standard human cognitive equipment. And barring some very unhappy uh, kinds of genetic uh, uh, variations, uh, basically most folks become, you know, come equipped with uh, this stuff. and. Uh, um, and it informs everything that we count as normal cognition. It informs a great deal and, and it affects everything we count as religious cognition. And uh, frankly, cognition associated with lots of mental disorders as well. Um, and what we're interested in is sort of stressing the continuities. Uh, so um, between these as a way of getting some explanatory uh, leverage on them. We don't, we don't need to belabor the figure, just get it out there. Um, and I'd like to add something to this. When you are talking about a phenomenon like religion, which is both a cultural entity as well as a cognitive entity, it helps to have some prototypical cases in mind, cases that are distinctively, and most people agree, if anything counts as religious, these cases count as religious. And this is one reason why in the book, there's quite a bit of focus and use of examples that have to do with what are called supernatural agents, first and foremost, God or gods. Why pick that? One reason you can pick that in a book like ours is because you're trying not to get lost in the sea of vagueness and ambiguity, but to find examples that you can use to illustrate the most salient cognitive mechanisms that are at work in religious cognition. So, for example, the mechanism of agency detection or the mechanism of disposition to construct narratives. You want to work on those dispositions. You don't want to draw the reader into a debate in which they have to come equipped with arguments for and against the existence of this, that, or the other entity. And that's also part of what we mean by ecumenical naturalism. There's an openness and a receptivity to looking at the diversity of religious experience and moving from prototypical cases to cases that may be less than prototypical. Mm -hmm. So since, at least as you propose in the book, there's a continuity between normal cognition, religious cognition, and mental disorders, is it uh, possible to strictly separate uh, relig uh, religious cognition from mental disorders 
when <coughs> when there are behaviors that seem or that propose that the person is suffering from a particular mental disorder but manifest themselves in a religious context? That's an excellent question. I'll start giving an answer to this question. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you will find people who are deeply religious who exhibit symptoms that otherwise may be construed as indices of a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there is a kind of religious scrupulosity that many highly religious people are sometimes committed to. And scrupulous behavior carried to unmanageable extremes can be quite harmful, and it can reflect upon the mechanisms that ordinarily keep it domesticated so it doesn't go out of hand and consume a person with obsessions about sin and offending God and punishment. You slide, you slip, you move over to something that really is beginning to count, not just as a symptom, which can occur on its own, but as an element in a disorder where it occurs with a body of other symptoms and constitutes an illness. So that's one aspect of your question, which is, is there some sliding there? Is there some slipperiness there? The answer is yes, but you have to regiment it. You have to give it some structure and say, here is why there's continuity. Here is the kind of continuity that's present. There's other kinds of continuities that are not present. Mm -hmm. I understand. So uh, another term that you use in the book that I would like to clarify, I think we've already touched on some of its aspects here, but uh, purpose-driven continuity theory, what is it about? Okay. Um, in general, whenever you're creating a scientific taxonomy or set of categories that have purposes both in the description of a phenomenon and in its explanation and its range across a culture, you have certain purposes in mind as to what the categories are supposed to be doing. And the question is, what are categories of the sort that might identify a religious-based illness doing in a theory of mental illness, broadly understood? And the idea behind a purpose-driven approach is you look at the purposes of these different categories in their different domains. In the United States, for example, let me take an analogy. We've just seen a major baseball game being played in a series called the World Series. Okay? And the question you want to ask is, which of the two teams that played in that series is the better team? Can we simply take it for the fact that the one that won is the best, or is the other team actually better? There might be some categorical reasons why you would want to argue that the team that won was not the best, because there are other purposes to playing the game, another context in which it's played, in which the team that lost a bit actually may have the better team. It's like asking who the best athlete is. The best athlete in one generation need not be the best in the other, because the purposes that drive the categorization differ from one generation to the other. And that's central to our view. There are purposes. So let me give you now an example from an illness to illustrate what I just meant. It's not mine. It's due to two philosophers here in the States, Hannah Pickard and Williamson and Armstrong. But you go to the doctor's office to have your eyes examined. They discover what your visual acuity is. And you think, oh, gee, I'm within the norm. I can see quite well. Maybe when I get a bit older, I'll need better glasses. But right now, I'm doing all right. And your friend is next to you, and he says, you're not doing all right. You're going to have trouble passing a road test. You go, road test? What do I need a road test for? All I want to know is what my vision is for. And your friend, who knows a bit of the history of optometry, says, that's not true. If you look at the evolution of the creation of the discovery and refinement of lenses and glasses, they were literally instrumental in enabling certain people to do certain things which they were outside of the office unclear what they could do. That's one of the purposes of having an ocular exam. There are many others, but that's just one. The same thing is the case with mental illnesses. 
you're going to find people that can manage their illnesses in world number one. They can't manage that same illness in a, in a world that's quite different. And so you have to say, what are the purposes here that are keeping us with this category of an illness in these diverse contexts? And you're going to get different answers to that question very often, depending on the context in which the question is being asked. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, maybe we will come back to this question later in the interview or at least some follow-ups to it. But can we gain new insights into mental disorders, where they come from, how they work with this approach that you present in the book? We are convinced that you can gain insights. Very pleased that some of our readers have already noticed that. We also are not annoyed when people disagree with us, provided they learn to change their belief system after they talk to us and read our book. That was not a nice answer, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we, the, the, let me give you a quick history here. Bob and I have known each other since we were neonates. We were out of graduate school. <laughs> and we were going to meetings and conventions. And Bob was, I think, at the University of Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. And I was at a university called Brandeis, which once had a PhD program. And we meet at these meetings. And we found we seem to have these overlapping connecting interests. That Bob is interested in religion, and I'm interested in religion, partly because of my background. I went to a Jesuit university in New York City. And we thought, as we were getting older, before we contract the symptoms of senile dementia, maybe we should work on something together, something that we share, something that we have only partially in common, but not fully in common. So, for example, we both have an interest in religion, but I haven't been that interested in cognitive systems. Bob has. He hasn't been interested in mental illness, but I have. Let's join them. Now, when you do that as an academic, you hope to produce some fruits. You hope to produce some things that are nourishing and move the field along. And so the answer to your question, have we hoped to move things along? is a decisive yes. And it reflects in part our history together as friends and colleagues, and it reflects also in part where we have done our previous work. Yeah. Uh, so before we go back to religion, let me just ask you another couple questions about uh, mental disorders. Should we say that mental disorders are illnesses in any way? Uh, that's a good question, because sometimes people think that the word illness is in some ways better behaved and more regimented than the word disorder. Mm -hmm. Ian Hacking, a distinguished philosopher who's written on multiple personality disorder, has said, I don't like the word disorder. I much prefer the word illness to the word disorder. The word disorder is so vague and so unregimented that I prefer to talk of an illness. And one reason Hacking had said that is because he was aware that in the history of medicine, the word illness originally entered the lexicon through talking about bodily illnesses. And in the case of bodily illnesses, say something like tuberculosis, for example, there is a decisive biomarker for the illness there's a regimented list of causes of the illness. And over the course of time, there's successful attempts through medication and otherwise to manage or remove the illness. In mental disorder, just the opposite has happened. The first DSM, a DSM, very Freudian, it's about 70 or 80 pages long. The most recent edition of DSM is hundreds of pages long. There dozens and dozens of alleged illnesses there and symptomatology. So it looks like just the opposite has happened. If, if you start talking about disorder as opposed to illness, but there's a good reason 
why the word disorder is now playing a role similar to that of illness in the category of psychiatric malaises. And that is because mental disorders seem, seem to be the sorts of things that sadly in certain environments are super abundant and come in different types and forms. And the old disorders like schizophrenia, the iconic disorders are coming apart at the seams. It turns out that two people with dramatically different symptoms can both be diagnosed as schizophrenic because the disparate symptoms of schizophrenia are such that they permit in closing dramatic diversity in the absence of uniformity of symptomatology. Okay. And I favor moving along somewhat in that direction. I, I, I have a way of recommending the notion of disorder and so on and so forth, which is not immediately germane to love in my book, but that's a long answer to your question, but I hope it helps. Yeah, yes. I if I might, I'd like to chip in another, uh, a further comment about it that's relevant, uh, directly relevant to the book. Sure. That is, uh, we focus on four disorders across four chapters that constitute the core of the book. Uh, but the fourth one, we quite clearly say, uh, and literally say, is the exception that sort of proves the rule. Um, and um, quite directly, uh, autistic spectrum disorders are not illnesses. Uh, in fact, I think there's a very credible case to make that basically, um, you know, the language of sort of being alternatively uh, uh, abled in certain domains is, is perhaps a better account of it, which is to say that at least for many, many high functioning uh, autistic people, um, it turns out that on a variety of, of cognitive measures, they actually uh, perform better than so-called neurotypical people. Um, and uh, I mean, one has to do with sort of perceptual acuity, the attention to perceptual detail, for example, is a, a well-established finding on that front. So uh, yet a further reason why George and I are reluctant to use the language of this, uh, sorry, of illness um, in, in the context of, of, our, of, our, of our book. Uh, beyond, it seems to me, the more fundamental principled issues that George has just been addressing. Yeah. Uh, another question would be, do mental disorders have a cultural component to them? I mean, maybe we could subdivide this question into two, into two other ones that, uh, that would be, so perhaps... Uh, how we classify m something as a mental disorder uh, comes partu partially from culture or uh, the dominant culture in a particular cultural context. I mean, maybe there are things that we use to classify as mental disorders that we don't classify as such now and vice versa. And then also... Uh, could it be that mental disorders and the way they manifest and develop in a particular person um, are also influenced by the culture that person lives in? Um, I mentioned Ian Hacking a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book on something which he called the Mad Travelers Syndrome. And the syndrome, the so-called mad traveler syndrome, is or was perceived as a kind of disorder that was a, so, that was a cousin of what we now call multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder. This particular cousin consisted of middle class and upper middle class men who would leave the environment in which they were born and raised go off someplace completely different, use a false name, claim false skills, create a totally different life, and then 20 or 30 later, years later, come back to their home and expect to rejoin the family in Kent. Culture? Yes. Look at the role that that particular disorder gave off to culture. This was go to another culture, be a different person. What could be more profound 
affecting your symptomatology than that. I mean, I didn't tell you this, but as a boy, I thought I was a professional baseball player. I would go up to my room at night and I would think to myself, boy, I would love to be playing second base at Ebbets Field. Okay. I never did that. I've been forlorn ever since. Young preteen. Lost in the culture. This happens all the time. Now, if you look at the history of DSM and psychiatric botanization, you'll find a number of former disorders that have been deleted. Homosexuality, okay. female hysteria, for example, especially women who might be pregnant, they're gone. It's an interesting story as to why they're gone. It has no direct connection with religiosity, but once again, culture came in, vacuumed the disorder away. It's not that there aren't people okay, who are anxious about their sexual orientations, but it doesn't deserve to be classified as a disorder, let alone an illness. So culture is a main ingredient there. Bob, I'll defer to you because you've written an awful lot on culture and related categories here. Well, I would just go on to add that, I mean, again, the sort of one of the central premises of the book is, is that uh, a crucial dimension of culture, namely religion, uh, ha often has a profound influence on uh, uh, the kind of shape that uh, mental disorders might take, uh, the um, uh, kinds of things that are, uh, in fact, you know, treated as disorders, uh, the kinds of people who are diagnosed with disorders. Um, I mean, to, get, to go back to small-scale societies, uh, and Roger Keesing's wonderful ethnography of the Quayo, right? I mean, he points out that uh, uh, it's, from a kind of standpoint of the ethnographer, right? I mean, the, at certain levels, the difference between religious seers and people who have mental disorders uh, are is not so easy to pull apart. But uh, once you sort of throw in the dimensions of their comparative social credibility uh, among the Quayo. Um, uh, I mean, in a short, even in the Quayo, a group that, uh, you know, is a small scale society in the Solomon Islands, uh, uh, it helps to be well connected. And if you're well connected and you have uh, these kinds of symptoms, uh, you're much more likely to be an insightful religious seeker as opposed to uh, uh, a borderline outcast of uh, someone who's in effect accorded to uh, categories of mental disorder. Uh, but the book is dedicated in part to uh, talking in, in multiple, multiple examples of, of how um, cultures shape the expression of these disorders and uh, their comparative acceptability, uh, the kinds of forms they can take. And I mean, of course, one of the common, one of the concepts we deploy is this notion that religions sometimes offer means for, in effect, kind of domesticating certain disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Dr. McCauley, you mentioned there a very interesting thing. Uh, you sort of alluded to the fact, I think, that is the correct interpretation of what you said. Please correct me if I'm wrong. but. You mentioned, I think, that um, perhaps uh, in different cultures there's different social roles to fulfill. And if uh, a particular mental disorder predisposes the person uh, toward being better at performing a certain role, then in that given society, maybe people don't consider that person uh, mentally ill or mentally disordered or don't, don't even see that maybe she has some sort of psychological issue. Well, it's perfectly possible. Uh, maybe even possible in our own cultures. Uh, um, I mean, there is a fairly extensive treatment at the outset of one of our chapters of two fairly famous uh, uh, religious figures in the Western world, uh, namely uh, Martin Luther and John Bunyan. 
Uh, and, you know, I mean, the suggestion um, actually by the literary scholar, Paul Cephalou, is, is that, um, in effect, you know, religion sort of gives them cover uh, for their, uh, what was, I mean, I think it's fair to say in Bunyan's case, it's fairly uncontroversial. Uh, that is to say that this is a person who suffered from OCD, uh, from obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and um, yet he was a religious leader, a famous author of uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, but also uh, the author of, a, of a, just a terrific book, uh, more of a memoir, almost autobiography, namely uh, Grace Abounding Amongst the Chief Among Sinners. Uh, to in the chief among sinners, um, and uh, what's it about? It's it's basically Bunyan sort of laying out this kind of tacking back and forth between the deepest conviction of his salvation, and then kind of constantly seeing himself as having failed, and then and, and uh, backsliding, and uh, not sort of doing what he should be doing. Uh, um, uh, Cephalo suggests that he calls this the Protestant order of salvation, uh, and, and in short, he thinks it's, um, it even kind of, he takes a stronger view than we do about this, that is to say, to kind of regularize uh, this. Uh, I mean, our view is, is that it domesticates uh, something that still is pathological, <laughs> but uh, that, that, that this is not some kind of uh, solution finally to the the kind of constant impact of obsessions and compulsions in someone who has OCD. Uh, but it, as again, it, uh, to use the metaphor, it, it, it gives them a kind of cultural cover. Mm -hmm. I understand. So before we start talking about the different mental disorders you go through in the book and relate to religious behavior, let me just ask you one general question. Uh, when it comes to the discussion surrounding if religion is a byproduct of adaptations that we've evolved or if, it, it, if it's itself an adaptation or if just the product of genetic drift or culture or, for example, cultural group selection. I mean, do you have any specific position on that? Do you fall more on one camp than the others? And how do you approach that in the book? I guess the first comment I would make about this is, and I think is vitally important for uh, folks who are outside the field as they sort of look in and, and, and begin to pursue interests in the field, and that is um, to stress that, that these positions are not inconsistent with one another, which is to say that uh, you could be uh, a, a hold the view that, sorry, let me back up. Why would they... Why is that at least obviously a possibility? Well, I mean, look, religion is a lot of things. Uh, religion has a lot of features. Uh, religions have uh, a number of recurring features. And of course, those are going to be the ones that, that the cognitive science of religion has been most interested in. But there are a variety of possible ways for explaining various recurring features. Some of those might be properly explained one way. Some of them might be properly explained another way. It's perfectly possible that some of these things have arisen straightforwardly on the basis of natural selection. There are certainly scholars in the field who have argued that. Uh, Joseph Baboya, uh, Jesse Deering, uh, uh, in particular about certain kinds of connections of religi religiosity and moral sensibilities. Um, but um, the particular position that um, I've put, a, it's not so much that I put a lot of my chips on it, it's just the one that I've been attracted to and most interested in working on developing, um, has been um, indeed the byproduct theory, uh, which suggests that it's kind of agnostic about whether or not uh, religion has selective uh, uh, advantages. Um, I, I should add, just as a quick footnote, that I find a, a, a fair amount of the more recent discussions uh, about cultural group selection, for example, about 
religion uh, quite plausible and, and much of it convincing. Uh, I should say also uh, Joseph Babulia's work on the connections between religion and sort of basically um, advantages to mental and physical health. Um, there, there's good evidence for that. Um, but the suggestion of the byproduct theory is precisely that uh, is, is sort of agnostic about whether or not those uh, features of religion are well understood as adaptations. The argument is, is that there are systems in the mind, um, probably evolved systems. I've used this language of maturationally natural systems in order to sort of avoid that decades long battle about their precise origins. Uh, rather, what I'm more interested in is their functions. Um, but um, that uh, are there for reasons that have nothing to do with religion and, frankly, don't have anything to necessarily do with one another either. I mean, uh, you know, the difference between our abilities to so readily acquire natural languages in contrast to our abilities to recognize individuals' faces, those are, those are very, very different kinds of capacities. Um, but religions uh, have, in short, the argument is, is uh, religions are going to be at an advantage if they involve representations that cue those systems. Um, and uh, that is to say that uh, because these are systems that are maturationally natural, which is to say, uh, uh, which I take to be a sort of subset of, of all of the kinds of forms of cognition that cognitive scientists call implicit cognition. Uh, implicit cognition is stuff that is intuitive, um, that comes automatically, uh, typically instantaneously. Um, it's mostly unconscious, uh, and people oftentimes find it fairly difficult to articulate. So as, for example, the three of us are seeing one another on a screen right now, where uh, George, of course, has got a mask, so that, that's a relevant feature here. It's, it's harder to interpret exactly what emotions he might be feeling, but you know, our ability to read people's emotions in their facial expressions is a, is a capacity that the overwhelming majority of humans have. Um, and feel fairly confident about, but we're not very clear about how we ever got it. Uh, nobody ever taught it to us. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, this is uh, uh, a puzzle, and I must say it's been these intuitions all along that have uh, this sort of intuitive knowledge that about which we feel incredible confidence most of the time. Um, where did it come from? Why do we feel such confidence in it? Uh, why do we get it so readily and automatically? Um, the, the suggestion is, is that if religions formulate or evolve in some way or other, or just happen by chance to some, come upon, uh, upon representations that sort of cue these systems operations, that this isn't likely to uh, make those, in short, those kinds of representations more appealing to human minds. Uh, and so that this is, will be an account of sort of why, in short, I've tried to argue that religion is cognitively natural. Uh, well, why? Because it's cognitively easy. Uh, these, uh, the, you know, the mind uh, has a whole set of inferences that automatically kick in. Um, I mean, I, if, well, that's enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let me just ask you a follow-up to that. Because I've had already uh, Joe Henrik on the show twice, and at a certain point you mentioned that uh, the sort of implicit cognition, as you called it, um, occurs in an overwhelming majority of humans. Is it universal? I mean, since we, now we have this discussion surrounding uh, weird psychology versus non-weird psychologies, do we know if these cognitive mechanisms are really universal? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, everyone's a little wary about using language of universality. Um, and I think rightfully so. Uh, uh, but I think that 
uh, these kinds of capacities, what are known uh, in the field as content biases. That's what mm -hmm. I'm interested in and what mm -hmm. the sort of, well, it's what byproduct theorists are interested in. Um, are, are probably, uh, if not universal, um, uh, well, in short, I guess what I would say is, is that their emergence really is a sort of part of normal cognitive development. And if it isn't there, uh, uh, I mean, if certainly if you live in a medicalized society, uh, you know, parents worry about their uh, offspring if they're not exhibiting these things on the sort of schedule that you would expect. Um, uh, I had a uh, granddaughter who was uh, uh, slower to crawl than my daughter thought she should be. And so, you know, she took that granddaughter to the doctor. What, you know, is there a problem here? What, what's going on? I mean, there's a whole host of, of uh, capacities of this sort, not just physical capacities, uh, motor capacities like crawling, but um, likewise uh, cognitive capacities. Um, the um, cultural group selectionists uh, like Joe, I mean, uh, to be straightforward again, I want to go back to the point I started out with, and that is um, these positions are not inconsistent with one another. That is to say, it, it's perfectly possible they might be inconsistent. I mean, they by, might both aspire to explain a very particular feature of religions and have alternative explanations. But quite frankly, that's not how it has usually worked. Um, what the byproduct theorists have been interested in is explaining why religious forms tend to recur across cultures. Uh, the world of religious studies is a world that has uh, sort of made its um, uh, made careers out of folks providing us with tremendous levels of detail about a variety of different, you know, uh, religious systems around the world. And it's, it's incredibly important to have that information at our fingertips um, and to have it for a variety of different reasons. But uh, the cognitive scientists of religion and, and naturalists more generally, including ecumenical naturalists, uh, are interested in one of the sort of underlying general patterns that, that sit beneath all of that incredible diversity of detail. Um, the cultural group selectionists, by contrast, uh, have focused on what they call uh, context biases. They agree that the content biases are there. They agree that, that we've got a pretty good account of, of uh, why religions take the forms that they do. They're out to explain some other things, but all of us are, um, and again, there can be multiple kinds of factors. Uh, you know, why religions might thrive may be overdetermined. It may be overdetermined by a host of psychological and cognitive kinds of considerations that we point to, but it might also be overdetermined by a host of, of social and psycho social psychological uh, and cultural features that the cultural group selectionists point to. Um, yeah. Okay, so, I, I mean, we've already run through several different introductory topics, I guess. Uh, let's get into the conditions, the psychological conditions that you explore in the book. So, you first talk about hallucinatory voices, I mean, is this simply applied in the context of schizophrenia or something else? Um, no. Um, verbal hallucinations or auditory verbal hallucinations occur in about 15% of the population and are not necessarily associated with psychiatric uh, symptomatology at all. People experience them when they're under conditions of George, can I interrupt you? I'm not sure I heard it clearly, and I want to make sure that the audience hears it clearly. Repeat that percentage again. It depends on who you read. I like one that talks about 15%. I, I, I can't give you the actual journalistic reference, but 
it's used by people like Richard Bento and others who talk about um, exactly, here, here's a concern, Bob has already discussed it and I've mentioned it. There are symptoms that aren't symptoms. By that I mean, in one context they're a symptom, but in another context they're not a symptom. They're just normal form, human variations, or as we put in the title of the book, religious abnormalities. They may be abnormalities of some sort. Um, so, or verbal auditory hallucinations tap into or utilize several cognitive systems of the sort that Bob is making reference to. They tap in, for example, to what's called the theory of mind system. They tap into what's called source monitoring. They tap into narrative dispositions that people have. You know, it's very interesting that when people have verbal auditory hallucinations, typically they attribute them to someone else. They're not just out of them, but they're going on in someone else's mental world. So it's not just simply, I am hearing my grandfather talk to me, but I'm hearing my grandfather talk to me. It's not just a voice, but it might have specific functions and purposes. And cultures enter in there too, as to who might be talking. There is also, take, take a phenomenon like depression. We discuss depression in the book. Mm -hmm. And we focus on just a case of Mother Teresa, who surprisingly to many suffered from a protracted and chronic experience of depression that had religious elements in it. She wrote in her memoir and her diaries and her notes to other people that try as she did to talk to God, she never would get a response from him. And yet she kept at it, she kept at it, she kept at it. She became and had periods of very profound, deep depression because she was not getting an answer from God and she stuck with it. Um, Bertrand Russell, very Taurus philosopher said, if you're going out to believe in God, try to pick one that makes you a better person and doesn't contribute to your suffering. Okay. Well, she picked one that in a sense didn't make her a better person. So there's that element of volitional credibility that enters there too, reinforced by cultural behaviors, prayer given, religious services, rituals, that all sort of comes together and marries in her. Um, knowing the systems that are very important, because if you're praying to someone, you're assuming that that someone is listening to you, understands what you're saying, and it is going to give you a response. But suppose you're praying to someone and you never get a response, or in your own mind, you never get a response. And you're, you know, that's going to produce a kind of anguish and emptiness after a while, especially in someone who had the kind of vocation she initially had to help those who were suffering and dying and in need of medication, which brings up another point. Susceptibility to an illness, and I'm going to state this ironically, can sometimes be a mark of a potential for mental health. You have gone someplace, addiction shows this, which is not something we terribly much to say about, but addiction shows that someone becomes addicted to a substance or to a form of pattern of behavior, and they notice things around them are collapsing and falling apart, and they gain an insight into a fact of the matter. John Stuart Mill, a very famous British philosopher, pointed out that nothing helped him more than becoming depressed when he was a 20-year-old because he was getting lost too much in words and to the truth of his philosophical system, and he rarely went for walks in the woods. He ruminated on his sadness and couldn't pull himself out of the forest that was the trees of his negativity, which happens a lot. And once again, starts as a system, as a symptom, disappears, returns as a symptom. The package of an illness itself 
typically contains multiple symptoms on different modes of, dis of display at different periods of time. The most successful treatments for some disorders are a combination of biochemical and psychotherapeutic uh, therapies, some of which work very well for people, especially for those people who um, are highly verbal and ruminate very much about their illness and so on. Mother Teresa, unfortunately, rarely did that with anybody. She would speak to her counselor, she would speak to her administrators, but she never was falling under the umbrella of a professional counselor or someone that could help her get out of her situation. Voices do the same thing. I remember when I was a youngster um, thinking that wouldn't it be great if you were a writer and you could hear the voices of your character in a book you were writing, because I like Moby Dick, for example, what a fascinating exercise it would be to be Ahab and in pursuit of the whale and hearing the voice and the resonance of the people on board the ship. Okay, well, that can start as a productive kind of behavior, but it can degrade into something that's harmful, uncontrollable, and then it can return. And that happens with religions, too. It's not all a display of negativity. There's also very real cases where people are aided and assisted by coming back out of an illness and recovering and reconstituting themselves, which is a topic in the last chapter of the book, where we discuss kinds of treatments that are sometimes used and useful for certain conditions rather than others. Mm -hmm. So, before we get more specifically into depression and perhaps explore how it might manifest uh, in a religious context, in the book you also talk about things like uh, inner speech, agency detection, theory of mind, I mean, perhaps some of the cognitive mechanisms that give a basis to religious thinking, I, I guess. Uh, so, uh, let's start with inner speech. Um, what is the role that it plays here and what are the aspects of it that you think are important to understand um, how people with certain mental disorders or even in normal cognition deal well, with the features of inner speech? Mm -hmm. is it need not be acoustic. There's a huge literature now on, that philosophers are contributing to about symptoms of different illnesses. One of them is hearing voices. And there is a huge mistake that some of my colleagues in philosophy, Bob and my our colleague, make about inner speech. They think, well, if it's speech, there has to be a sound. Okay can't just be a thought. But yet, almost 40 to 50 percent, depending on who you read, of people who suffered from verbal auditory hallucinations claim to hear, but oftentimes refer to what they're hearing as silent. So it sounds, and I'll quote one of them right here, like a thought, though it's more than a thought, and less than annoyed. This part contributes to complications in treating these people, but it's there. Now, why is that important? Let's go back to social cognition again. There may be no more active, more revealing cognitive mechanisms about the role of culture in the emergence, the persistence, and the treatment of mental disorder, which we were discussing several minutes ago, mm -hmm. than verbal auditory hallucinations, because they're tapping into theory of mind, they're tapping into a phenomenon known as source monitoring, and they're revealing the human disposition to wrap an experience around a story, around a narrative. They come together, verbal auditory hallucinations. They, okay. Um, and sometimes they're encouraged, they're thought to be a good thing, as Bob well has pointed out. You know, Mother Teresa was used, used to, by a biographer, was 
spotted in a chapel saying her prayers. And the person that wrote the biography of Teresa, he noticed that there were a whole bunch of pilgrims that had come to the chapel to watch her pray. They wanted to learn how to pray. All she was doing was kneeling and mumbling a bit, but they thought she was Mother Teresa, so that whatever she was doing was good. It wasn't. She would go back and write in her diary, God was silent again. I could not hear his voice. The last person in the world you want to imitate if you're thinking of becoming a committed theist would be her. She was profoundly unhappy at different periods in her life. Somebody else might have that verbal auditory hallucination that she so much wanted, though would never call an hallucination. And we become enriched and ennobled by the experience they thought of having God communicate with them. Okay, but the three dispositions that are operative there, there are others, theory of mind, source monitoring, the disposition of narrativity, figure robustly in verbal auditory hallucinations, and a closely related phenomenon called delusions of thought insertion. Okay. Thought insertion is a fascinating symptom. It occurs very frequently among people that suffer from religious hallucinations and have diagnoses of schizophrenia. It's where you think that someone else is thinking in your head. They are inserting their thoughts, not influencing you to have their thoughts. It's not like they're whispering, think about your grandmother, you never did like her. It's not that's going on. But the thoughts are being placed in your head. They are thinking inside you. This creates a sense of the self as something porous and permeable that can be, as it were, invaded or operating at the beginning quest of someone else who's sharing their thoughts with you. And many religious people have cases of thought insertion where they think God is trying to help them by giving them certain thoughts, or the devil is trying to hurt them by giving them certain thoughts. Um, did I understand your question? I probably answered five other questions and didn't answer <laughs> No, but you touched on the question that I asked you. So, I mean, perhaps uh, I will come back to theory of mind when we talk about autism spectrum disorder later in the interview. Uh, would there be any other thing about depression applied to a religious context that you would like to add? Um, there's a well-known expression called dark night of the soul which is sometimes applied to cases of religious depression that have two primary phases. One of them is called anguish, the other is called desolation. Anguish is where God is not listening to you, he's not paying attention to you, but he might if you keep on with your behavior. And then there's the desolation of not having an answer or not having a response. Okay, now these two phases they're not restricted to religion. You could have them with respect to the failure of marriage, or to your career, or whatever. And once again, when we get inside them, what do we see? What do we notice? And one of the things we notice in, in these cases is the desire for something that breaks in and changes a person so that they're living a better life and being a better person than they otherwise might be. And when that doesn't work, it becomes work. So I think that's enough said there. Mm -hmm. So let's now talk about uh, scrupulosity and obsessive compulsive disorder. We've already mentioned the case of Luther here. Um, so, what are the kinds of behaviors that we can observe in religious contexts where this kind of condition, obsessive compulsive disorder, might manifest? Um, the two phenomena that we end up focusing on at greatest uh, length are, um, of course, ritual. Uh, 
uh, religions have rituals and patients of uh, people who are afflicted with OCD uh, have all sorts of compulsive rituals that they uh, engage in as well. Um, the other is um, uh, what has come to be known as thought action fusion. Um, thought action fusion is uh, sort of comes in two varieties. Uh, typically, uh, both are involved, and that is is that having a thought can cause something to occur in the same way as if you had acted. Um, so if I think that uh, uh, my team is going to win, uh, that'll help them win. Or, uh, uh, But in addition, if I think a bad thought about uh, doing something to a, uh, someone I perceive as an enemy or a foe, um, that, uh, you know, that that likewise uh, will increase the probabilities of that that occurring. Um, but then uh, a sort of moral side to it, uh, the first is what uh, is called causal thought action fusion, and then there's a sort of moral thought action fusion, and that is um, that if I indeed have bad thoughts, uh, which we all have, uh, at, points in our lives, uh, that they uh, are just as morally problematic as bad actions. Um, uh, and note, I mean, uh, this fairly readily fits into the kind of framework uh, that is out there in the cognitive science of religion, or in Noren Zion's book, uh, Big Gods. Of course, one of the principles of, of big gods is that they're watching you. Um, and uh, But note, they're watching your behavior. Uh, as Pascal Boyer has argued, uh, it's also the case that some of these gods turn out to have uh, all the knowledge there is to have about your mind as well and what's going on there. So there are your actions, but right then there are these untoward thoughts that you might have. Um, these are actually uh, uh, features that uh, are quite uh regular uh, amongst folks with obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, they have an overwhelmingly inflated sense of their responsibility for everything that occurs around them. And of course, then if not good things occur, their fear that they were uh, uh, somehow importantly responsible. Um, they do indeed accord undue importance to thoughts. Um, they have consequently an excessive concern with sort of controlling thoughts. Um, but then you sort of combine that with some other features of, of the, um, uh, the disorder, and that is they also tend to overestimate hazards. Um, and uh, they have been described as having an intolerance of uncertainty. Uh, some philosophers have had that also in the history of, uh, of our field, Martin George's field, uh, but um, and, uh, happily did not have to come out with such dire consequences because of it. Uh, and likewise, uh, uh, a concern with perfectionism. So note, if you've got these worries about your thoughts, you've got to control them. They might have causal uh, uh, import. Um, and... Uh, in addition, you live in a world that's filled with hazards and, and all kinds of problems, and you don't tolerate certainty, then um, in short, what are you going to do with the latter problem? You're going to do a whole bunch of things over and over and over and over and over again to resolve those hazards um, or potential hazards. Um, the reason you have to keep doing them over and over again is because you can't tolerate certain or uncertainty. Uh, and that is to say, you're reassured in the course of carrying out that sort of, in effect, ritualized action, um, that what has become, in effect, a ritualized action. Uh, but the second you're done carrying out that action and try to get back to life, right, the worry arises again. Uh, and... Um, you're uncertain. I mean, among other things, one of the findings, important findings in this literature is, um, and, and, it's, and again, this is not just true about people with OCD, it's true about all of us. The more often you do a task over and over, a repetitive task over and over and over again, 
the less confident you are about, for example, the precise details of any particular time doing that. And that even includes the last time you did it. Uh, and sure enough, that's just the kind of uncertainty that can, can prove to be unnerving. Um, scrupulosity is, uh, as one of uh, the um, memoirs that I've read by an OCD uh, uh, person, a person with OCD, uh, described it rather, I thought, rather drolly as OCD plus Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's the notion that this same kind of uh, excessive concern with thoughts, um, uh, concern about hazards in the world about, um, and this intolerance of, of uncertainty uh, surrounds moral and religious questions, moral and religious issues and matters. Um, so this, uh, the, the scrupulous uh, folks who suffer from scrupulosity uh, typically have a pretty narrow focus on certain sorts of, say, rituals that have to be carried out uh, because it absolves them of, of uh, responsibility with regard to, you know, sin, for example. Um, uh, these are typically issues, uh, I mean, you know, think about things like um, you catch yourself daydreaming while you're in a religious service and everyone's praying, right? Well, that's kind of thing that can unnerve a, a scrupulous person. Um, the community in general sort of has a broad understanding that, okay, yeah, sometimes people daydream and this happens, uh, and they don't regard it as, a, as a, uh, a profoundly critical weakness or problem or anything that, that um, creates any kind of crisis. But for the scrupulous person, that's a, that's a point that, in effect, fires all these systems into play or gets them all rolling. Uh, the problems uh, in a scrupulous uh, individual can ultimately interfere with their ability to kind of participate in um, a kind of normal way in the, in the life of the religious community. Um, it can interfere in short with normative religious uh, practices. Um, Crucially, and actually this is something that um, probably we should clarify from the outset, uh, going all the way back to, or should have clarified from the outset, but going all the way back to questions about simply what are mental disorders and so forth, and, uh, what might be you know, the illnesses, or, uh, but it seems as though absolutely the crucial criteria, uh, the, the principal criterion is going to be, do the people who have these problems are they troubled by them? And any question that the scrupulous people are troubled by their scrupulosity. Um, and um, uh, scrupulosity is quite standardly uh, accompanied with all the sort of other symptoms of OCD, the perfectionism, uh, the uh, thought action fusion, and, and so on. Um, I've forgotten exactly the form of the question that you asked, but I hope I've at least spoken enough around it that we've gotten to what you were after. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I have another, uh, you answered my question, but I have another one about OCD specifically. So OCD is associated with rituals and when applied to religion, some religious rituals. So, uh, could it be possible for us to say that OCD is what's behind the development of those rituals? That is, it, it would have been people uh, that suffered from OCD that created these rituals uh, that applied in the religious context simply stuck with people for one reason or another? Or could it be that these rituals already existed and people who suffered from these conditions were able to alleviate some of the symptoms, the symptoms, the negative feelings by participating in them? And so they gravitated towards uh, religion, for example. Um, well, you're asking an origins question. And I mean, I, my guess is, is that the answer is probably all of the above. 
I, I guess I'm, I, I don't think it's likely that all religious rituals start with, uh, you know, participants who had OCD. Uh, but, I mean, for a variety of reasons. First of all, um, as uh, we were in showing that first figure and talking about the continuities, I mean, the sorts of things that lead to ritualization among people with OCD are in fact, fairly normal systems. I mean, we're concerned about hazards as well. Uh, Pascal Boyer and Pierre Linard, all, moreover, argue that at certain stages of life, they're crucially important from an evolutionary standpoint that, um, that, that humans manifest these things fairly naturally. Uh, and, and one of them has to do with the birth of offspring. Um, you know, and at least in America, it's often called nest building, uh, you know, the kind of preparations for the arrival of a child. And then uh, profound concern, uh, uh, a, a very popular Hollywood movie years and years ago now, Terms of Endearment. Uh, Shirley MacLaine um, plays a, uh, at that point in the movie, she's a younger mother. Um, and she comes barging into her little baby's bedroom and she walks over and she pinches the baby, right? Why? Well, the baby starts crying and, and, and her response was, good, right? That is to say, she was reassured the baby was alive and well and that was what needed to be checked. And so she departs the room again. Um, um, so given that that there is evidence of sort of widespread interests uh, and, and manifestations of ritualization in humans uh, that at certain stages of life it's fairly regular but also remember uh, the point Kiesing makes about the quiet I mean it's he wasn't making a point about OCD but rather more about hearing voices and things like that but still um, uh, if uh, if OCD has become debilitating which it often does um, that's probably not going to carry the kind of uh, social and cultural uh, plausibility and, and uh, acceptability that would uh, enlist, you know, uh, the whole community to be involved. So, you know, is that possible? Sure, it's possible. Is it likely that it was probably responsible for most rituals? I, I guess I'm probably a little skeptical about that. I mean, we should also note that, I mean, ritual is, um, or at least what we might call ritualized behaviors are, are pervasive in the animal kingdom as well. So it, it looks like this goes fairly deep in our phylogeny. I'd like to add something here, Bob, to what you're saying. Bob mentioned the importance of troublesomeness when it comes to the attribution of a mental disorder. Well, troublesomeness is troublesome. There are different kinds of troubleness. There's one kind of troubleness which you recognize as a trouble, and another kind of troubleness which you don't recognize as a trouble. There's a personality disorder, which is known as narcissistic personality disorder. Being around someone with this disorder is very troublesome to people other than the person, but the person who has the disorder is so, as it were, immune to self-criticism of a certain sort that they're not troubled by their own troublesomeness. But there are two other things that may enter into the attribution of such a disorder. One is harmfulness. Disorders can be very harmful to people which they don't recognize and aren't troublesome to them but should become troublesome. And the third one is the ability to control the behavior. It's oftentimes just not abidingly present in a good way, as witness cases of addiction and cases of OCD perfectly illustrate how it is that you can enter into the world of an obsessive compulsive behavior, try to introduce yourself into controlling it, and will only heighten your anxiety and deepen the entrenchment of the behavior. So we've got troublesomeness, harmfulness, inability to control. They're critical. One feature of religion, which was made very prominent in the work of Freud, is that we human beings see ourselves as alone in a dangerous world, and we need the help we can get. And on Freud's view, this turns many of us into theists, where we turn to some kind of benevolent deity to protect us. 
and then something ironic happens. That deity becomes unmanageable him or herself, uncontrollable. You've added another dimension, a higher order of uncontrollability to the existential situation you're in. And become you become very vulnerable to forms of obsessive compulsive behavior that are not good for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we move on to autism spectrum disorder and theory of mind, uh, let me just ask you a general question. Can we say that sometimes at least religion can cause or contribute to the development of some of these disorders? Uh, our response, our response to that is we raise that question and we explore it in the book, as you know, and, and uh, um, I, it was interesting to see, you know, the way you even formulated it right there. You started out by saying, can we say that it causes religion, but then, well, does it, you know, enhance the development of it or, uh, and that's just what we suggest. That is to say the sort of bare causal question probably has multiple possible interpretations. Um, our answer is is that uh, with regard to things like domesticating uh, OCD, uh, again, we uh, start the chapter out by talking about John Bunyan and Martin Luther and suggest that, and following Cephalo in part, uh, that um, sure, uh, it's conceivable that religion sometimes provides cover for folks with OCD. I mean, not unlike by the way, a phenomenon that's just occurred this year, also current, and George's mask, you know, reminds me of it. And that is, this was this became a major concern uh, once we the COVID pandemic arose, and that was uh, one of the clear instructions was about hand washing. Uh, and this is something that folks with OCD are um, do compulsively. And so, indeed, as it were, it provides them, the, these circumstances provide them a kind of cultural cover for that. Um, uh, we also want to suggest that, that uh, and in some ways, this is really kind of uh, the linchpin of, of, of what we're arguing uh, in that chapter, and that is that religious uh, 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 systems around the world have evolved to have uh, a couple of mechanisms uh, that um, indeed uh, can at least increase the amount of uh, or the, the percentage of folks who, who have OCD expressing it as scrupulosity. And that is precisely uh, ritual uh, and uh, 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 thought action fusion. And of course, in some religions, interestingly, religions that have been pretty successful religions, uh, the, right at the top of the list, of course, is Christianity. But I mean, it's in, it, frankly, it's in Judaism as well. I mean, in the Decalogue, when you're told not to, uh, 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 you know, want things that your other, your neighbor has and so on, that, uh, I mean, you know, that's a prohibition of a mental state. Uh, but likewise, Jesus tells us that, you know, if a man looks on a woman with desire, it's, it's, it, you know, it's just like moral thought, action, fusion. It's just as bad as if indeed he had uh, committed adultery with that, that person. Um, so um, that and um, likewise a sort of set of rituals that quite routinely appear. And I mean, this is, there, I don't think it's any coincidence that, that, the two elements, although there's great variability in religions, the two elements that pretty much pop up in almost just, just about all of them are rituals and myth, of course, but rituals in particular. Um, uh, well, uh, what, what's going on here? Well, you're, you know, you're inducing a kind of temporary um, um, set of mental states in, in a perfectly normal population because they end up feeling in many ways the way a person with OCD feels. Um, I guess the strongest form of the causal question would be, does religion, you know, for example, can it increase the rate at which uh, OCD occurs in a population? And I want to stress there is no evidence for that. 
Um, that is to say, depending on who's measuring it, uh, the general consensus seems to be that OCD is, uh, plagues somewhere between 1% and 3% of the population. And um, there is no evidence uh, in the most religious societies or the least religious societies that those uh, uh, estimates change in any important way. Okay, so uh, let's now get into autism and theory of mind. So we know that people who suffer from this condition, of, of course it occurs on a, spe on a spectrum, but people who suffer from this condition have reduced theory of mind. So, I mean, what would you like to say about that and how does it manifest in religion? Um, we, uh, to back up and, and kind of frame the, the uh, question you've asked, but also to connect with a comment I made earlier, as I said, we started out the, uh, the chapter by saying that uh, in including autistic spectrum disorders, uh, we were aiming to sort of uh, provide an analysis of what we took to be the exception that proves the rule. Uh, this is a stand, I don't know if there's a, such a, a phrase in, in Portuguese and uh, in, in, uh, Portugal's culture, but this is a standard phrase in, in America and English. And it's actually one that's always bothered me because uh, exceptions don't prove rules. Um, there's only yeah, one. We have that phrase in Portuguese as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, exceptions don't prove rules. Uh, it seems to me there's only one kind of way in which this claim makes sense. And that is, is that if the principles of a theory tell you why an exception is an exception. And um, so what we were suggesting is that indeed the kinds of uh, considerations that we pointed to throughout the book uh, with regard to maturationally natural cognitive systems uh, that, uh, as George was laying out with uh, hearing voices, uh, you know, are operating uh, with these the inputs. I mean, you know, you know, linguistic processing, agency detection, theory of mind, uh, uh, source monitoring, uh, narrativity, and so on. Um, I mean, these things, if they are cued, they they kick in. Um, and the argument was uh, actually an argument that I. Uh, been making in one form or another now for about 20 years, uh, all the way back from a paper in 2000 uh, uh, called The Naturalness of Religion and the Unnaturalness of Science, um, was that um, if Simon Baron Cohen is correct in his claim that uh, uh, folks with autistic spectrum disorders are to some or greater or lesser extent, as he puts it, mind blind, um, then given the kind of typically pretty central role that theory of mind plays in so many religious representations, and in particular in our interactions, our putative interactions with uh, these agents that possess superhuman uh, abilities, um, the suggestion would be then, well, if these folks have got uh, a problem uh, about theory of mind, um, that, that it doesn't, so to speak, reading other people's minds doesn't come naturally to them in the way that it seems to come naturally to most of the general population after they've achieved a certain level of uh, cognitive maturity, um, a variety of experimental measures for that. Um, that, uh, in short, the uh, neurotypical population successfully, successfully ma uh, manages uh, uh, with the false belief task uh, in the fifth year of life, whereas uh, for even very high-functioning folks with autistic spectrum disorders, that doesn't typically happen until they're 13 or uh, in their teenage years. Um, the suggestion then is, is that to the extent that an awful lot of religious thought, belief, and uh, uh, practices turn on having some comprehension of, in short, you know, the gods' minds, 
that there might be reason to expect some deficits here um, with regard to folks who don't have uh, what in at least one version of this language is known as a sort of theory of mind module, right? Um, and that was a, a suggestion I sort of threw out there uh, 20 years ago. Um, and it turns out some other folks were thinking along these lines as well. Um, and um, happily then after it uh, got sort of beefed up in a larger discussion in a book I published in 2011, um, Why Religion is Natural and Science is Not, uh, a number of it, folks, uh, uh, experimentalists, got interested in this. <laughs> it is. It's an. It's a. You know. It's a thoroughly empirical question. Uh, uh, probably most prominently uh, was work by R. N. Zion and his colleagues, uh, in which they had um, uh, studies that looked at very large populations done online. Uh, where they, in short, gave people measures of, um, of sort of theory of mind abilities. Uh, uh, Baron Cohen has got a whole set of tests for sort of checking these things out to measure what he calls uh, AQ and uh, SQ and so on, um, autism quotient. Um, and uh, then they had a set of uh, questionnaires measuring religiosity. And uh, Norn Zion got, and colleagues got some fairly startling uh, findings, which is to say that they seem very much to corroborate the conjecture I'd offered. Um, and that was that, uh, um, but, uh, well, uh, in short, that, that uh, folks who sort of tested more uh, as, uh, uh, or, or showed, as it were, less, ability with theory of mind capacities uh, tended to be, in short, less religious. Um, there is a, a huge body of research that has arisen since then. I dug out, actually, while we took a break, I dug out a, a slide, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share this one as well. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Is uh, a summary. I mean, this is for the, the the scholars in the field. We won't leave it up long. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, some of the most prominent papers uh, that have come up. Uh, but um, one of the issues that I would like to stress is is that um, you know the position I was advancing was simply saying that that folks who have theory of mind deficits typically folks we say are on the autistic spectrum disorder, are not going to have all those implicit inferences that arise with this theory of mind capacity in the same way that they arise with things like contamination avoidance or face recognition or anything like that. Or, I mean, we have a whole host of inferences that we draw instantly on the basis of, of inputs that we get. So that they are unlikely to be able to sort of carry out um, quite as readily or as uh, soundly, um, in short, implicit religious inference. Um, that's kind of gotten ex mixed in with uh, the question of whether or not they in fact have explicit belief, uh, which I see as a rather different issue, quite frankly, uh, and something a good deal more elaborated. But um, in short, I think people have explicit beliefs for all kinds of reasons, or at least are willing to say that they do. Um, and that that doesn't, you know, that that feature of sort of um, uh, explicit cognition it rides at, at a very different plane than the questions that I was raising about implicit cognition. In short, this is a whole list of or a list of, of many of the most prominent papers that have come out. The crucial thing to notice about it, unless people are really interested in having the references, are the little pluses and minuses over there on the left, the green pluses and the red minuses, okay? Uh, and they have to do with whether or not uh, there was uh, a problem about implicit inference and explicit belief, uh, because most folks got really excited and interested about uh, actually a, a position that really Nor Norrin Zion was laying out in his experimental papers, in which he was quite forwardly, uh, straightforwardly saying, in short, and indeed in Big Gods later on, he says that 
you know, there are lots of versions of atheism. I think he's exactly right about that. Uh, but one of them is sort of uh, an atheism that is built on sort of theory of mind deficits. Um, I assume folks have seen plenty that they want to see there. Uh, so, uh, let me just ask you one thing. It's very interesting that you showed this slide, because one of the questions that I have here for you is, so when we are studying religion, let's say, from an anthropological perspective, and trying to understand why people behave the way they do, and the effects that religion might have on people's behavior. Is it important to also know the content of people's beliefs? Or can we just uh, know, for example, or study the, their implicit cognition, the, the implicit cognition mechanisms, let's say, that underlie religion, and perhaps their overt behavior. I guess you know my view is is that uh, this is sort of the question is is the whole story about implicit cognition or is, does explicit cognition matter as well? And with regard to religious behavior, with the forms and shapes that religions take, and so on. Sure, I mean all these things matter. There's no presumption here that that we're sort of laying out a comprehensive story about everything that's to be said about religion. In fact, quite to the contrary, uh, as it seems to me, all sciences proceed. What we're doing is beginning to get a theoretical and explanatory uh, hand or a theoretical handle that gives us some explanatory leverage to extend the metaphor uh, on some features about religious thought, about religious life, about religious experience, about religious behavior. Uh, but it's not to say it's the whole story or it's the most important story. Uh, to some extent, to be candid, I do think it's uh, some of the, uh, it's a somewhat unexpected story. And so that kind of makes it um, a lot of fun intellectually. Uh, but uh, but the, there's no presumption that that, you know, this is um, a project that is is going to put other projects out of business. Quite to the contrary, uh, I hope that they are all mutually illuminating and enriching. Well, it's a framework, I think, Bob. We're trying to set up a framework which can encourage certain forms of interdisciplinary investigation that cut across fields that normally don't speak to each other in a systematic, regimented way. So, for example, you mentioned, Ricardo, that you're about to ask us a question about the last chapter. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and one of the things that, um, one of the points we try to make in the last chapter of the book is there are going to be implications for our view and how psychotherapies for disorders that have religious components ought to be treated. And one way in which we're suggesting they not be treated is that they not be treated as if religion is being dismissed and not taken seriously, and religious ideas are being debunked by us. That's not our intention at all. Someone who is a very devout religious person and theist, we hope, we believe, can look at our book and see there the ingredients of the human mind that are operative in cases of relevant cases of disorder and have a better handle on what forms of therapy and psychotherapy might help a person who otherwise is religious and is going to stay religious or may not. It's, there's a kind of an openness, a therapeutic ecumenism, if you will, that uh, we, we hope to encourage by the book. Mm -hmm. So just before we finish, would you like perhaps to touch a little bit on the other uh, prospective projects that you mentioned in the book, like, for example, religious terrorism and psychopathy and the possible secondary gains of mental disorder? Yes, let me just quickly mention psychopathy. Mm -hmm. One of the big debates about psychiatric diagnoses and treatments is whether or not 
in some cases at least, maybe in many cases, there is a strong component of a kind of moral indecency or moral irregularity in certain kinds of illness. Nothing is perhaps more vividly exemplary of that than psychopathy and psychopaths. And there are two schools of thought here. One is psychiatry should not go into the realm of moral judgment. Psychiatry should be conducted in a kind of agnostic realm where moral issues may surface every now and then, but they are not being given special attention. They're not part of the diagnostic enterprise. The other is they not only are part of the diagnostic enterprise, but are inescapably so and cannot be helped. And therefore, there must be a way of understanding the moral dimensions often to psychiatric diagnosis because they're prominent. Pedophilia, for example, certain sorts of personality disorders. Um, and the point we're making in the last chapter of the book is vote for view two, not for view one. Our job is not to segregate the moral from the non-moral, the religious from the non-religious, but quite the contrary, to show how the mechanisms of the moral and the non-moral, the religious, the non-religious, interpenetrate each other and affect each other and play a role in the person who has the illness. Uh, very crucial. As far as terrorism goes, um, one of the things that is so disturbing about terrorism is that it attracts what seem to be some mentally able, quite well-prepared, sensitive people. They're drawn to a religious framework in which to encase and encode, and I would say entomb, their terrorism. Therapies who deal with religious terrorists often have trouble knowing what to do with the terrorist personality. It's obviously a personality disorder, and it's disrespectful of human life. We're suggesting that there are certain mechanisms at work in religious terrorism, as there are in other forms of religious disorder. And by looking carefully at what some of those mechanisms might be in the terrorist personality, which we offer no surmise they were of in our book, but by looking very carefully at what these mechanisms might be in the terrorist personality structure, we're in a better position to treat, care for, maintain, therapeutically resurrect someone who might have and a very unwelcome experience of a terrorist personality disorder. Yeah, it, I guess we see it on an analogy with the points we were making about scrupulosity earlier, which Perfect. is to say, um, you know, religions constitute cultural forms that provide means that, in effect, not just domesticate uh, scrupulosity, but indeed can even kind of cultivate it, uh, so that, for example, OCD is more often uh, um, um, manifested as scrupulosity. Well, the, the analogy, is, the suggestion is here again, religions, some religions seem to have come up with forms that uh, elicit, uh, at least temporarily, in the way that rituals and thought action fusion might with regard to sort of behavior in normal people that looks a lot like OCD, behavior in normal people that looks a lot like psych psychopathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's end uh, on that note. And uh, before we go, again, guys, the book is Earing Voices and Other Matters of the Mind, What Mental Abnormalities Can Teach Us About Religions. Run and Buy It is a very, it's a very interesting book. And Dr. Macaulay, Dr. Graham, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Our Thank you for having us. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields.
So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Deza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis Franz, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.